Hello students, welcome to this online session on simulated maximum likelihood. This is a topic that can be a little bit uh, hard to grasp at first, primarily because it requires you to remind yourselves of a lot of the stuff that you learned earlier on in some of the core uh, econometrics courses and basic statistics courses. So we're going to go through it uh, slowly here and hopefully it will aid your understanding of this um, topic. So, in general, what we're talking about in simulated maximum likelihood is uh, highly relevant when we get to a setting where we have panel data. So, when we have panel data, we can start talking about these individual fixed effects that we call alpha i. Let me just get rid of these. And we remember from the, uh, we're going to compare OLS and maximum likelihood estimation for the same model, the linear model here, but it, it applies to many, many more models. But when we, when we don't have any uh, individual effects alpha i, we just used pooled OLS or pooled maximum likelihood, and we pretend that the data, even though it comes from the same individual at two different time periods, we just uh, assume that it's iid over both individuals and time, and basically pool the entire data set uh, and treat it as if people at different points in time were completely different people. When we allow for an alpha i, but we assume that it's completely independent of xi, of the observed x's, then we recall from our OLS setting that there we could use the random effects estimator, but actually that just using pooled OLS gave us consistent consistent estimates of the betas, it was just that we w our standard errors would be wrong, we would have heteroscedasticity, um, and the random effects estimator is more efficient, but uh, standard OLS is still uh, consistent. In maximum likelihood there's also an equivalent of the random effects, and using this will give you uh, correct standard errors, um, but whereas in OLS it it didn't make this, the pool estimator inconsistent when you have these uncorrelated random effects. In maximum likelihood, it will often be the case that it will make your uh, standard estimator inconsistent. So in maximum likelihood, recall that we're making assumptions on the full distribution of the data, so any violations of those assumptions can cause our, um, our per uh, our per estimator to become inconsistent. But if we use a random effects estimator, we're good. And um, here we can also use uh, random effects estimators, an example of a random coefficients model. And random coefficients models are, in my opinion, really why you want to think about uh, uh, these types of effects in a, a maximum likelihood model or a nonlinear model. Um, and that's an example where you get some more richness. Uh, from your model compared to a basic OLS setting. Uh, I'll return to that in uh, uh, later and we'll talk about it at the lectures. But basically you can think of uh, in any individual can have a different effect of an X. So we can have any individual can have their own betas, their own coefficients, it can be a distribution of coefficients and this type of estimator will allow us to say something about what does that distribution look like. It could be a distribution of marginal propensities to consume or price elasticities, and we can say something about how dispersed is that distribution. When we go to the setting where the alphas are correlated with the x's, in OLS recall that random effects and pooled OLS are no longer consistent, but fixed effects and first differences will now work. Uh, they, they give consistent estimates. In a nonlinear setting, we're typically not that fortunate. We can use things that can try to deal with it, but they typically cannot deal with it in as general of a setting as the fixed effects. So the fixed effects and first difference estimator allow for any type of correlation between alphas and x's because they, we do a transformation where they disappear. But in a, in a nonlinear model, it, it, sometimes there are transformations that we can use or sufficient statistics approaches, but typically not. We can try to use dummy variables then to estimate a dummy for every single individual. This will typically have something that's called the um, incidental parameters problem. 
uh, namely that estimating so many parameters leads to a bias in the betas. Uh, but if you have a large T, then that might work. And correlated random effects allows for a weak kind of relationship between alphas and x's, but only in a limited sense, not as general as fixed effects. So in general, in the nonlinear models, we're kind of screwed when we have fixed effects correlated with the x's. Okay, I'm going to start talking about uh, pooled estimation and what happens there. So this is the random effects model that I'll be talking about throughout the session. We have yit, and then we have our usual xit beta, which has an intercept in it as well, so there's a constant in xit. And then we have this alpha i term that is iid normal with some variance sigma alpha squared. And then we have our usual uit, which is uh, iid normal with a sigma u. And the important part is that alpha is time constant. So in OLS, we can just do first differences or uh, demeaning to estimate the betas, um, but in this case, the alphas here, when they're iid normal, they're uh, independently distributed uh, at every single i, so in particular they're independent of xit. And this means that uh, OLS estimates will still be consistent. So let's have a look at what that data might look like. This is the data set that you get. You don't know what the alphas are, but because I created the data set, I can actually uh, distinguish between different alphas. In particular, I can uh, select and color the, the observations red if alpha is smaller than zero and blue if alpha is greater than zero. So really this point cloud that is the only data we observe as a researcher uh, consists of these two different types. But because the alpha, uh, and, uh, and in general there, there's a continuous distribution of alphas and here it's colored such that the darkest blue is the lowest alphas and the lightest yellow is the uh, highest alphas. So you can kind of sense how there's a gradient across the distribution like this. All right, but if we just run the pooled OLS regression, we actually get a consistent estimate here, uh, which is our, the red line here is the prediction. Um, but if we were able to condition on the alphas, we could run different regressions and different subgroups of the alphas. And here you can see that if I run the blue dots are the ones with alpha, um, oh, sorry, that's wrong here, alpha greater than zero, and the, and the yellow dots are alpha smaller than zero. So you can see that they're shifted up, but the two lines are parallel. So, we, the, the, so the lines have the same slope, and that's what we're estimating. And this is uh, the sense, this is why uh, our uh, estimate on beta isn't contaminated by the presence of the alphas because they're completely independent of where on this x-axis uh, you are. Alright, how do we go about this in maximum likelihood? So the model again looks like this. We have our alpha i here that's normal and constant over time with, uh, and then the u term. So simulating the data set here uh, amounts to simulating one alpha for every n, for every observation, and error term u, uh, there we need one for every n and every t, and then we repeat the alphas so that we can add them, the x's are nt, and the u's here are nt, so we have to repeat the alphas so that we add the same alpha within each block of individual observations and that's what this thing does. It will repeat the alpha so it's alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 2, alpha 2, alpha 2, and so forth. So that's how we simulate the data. Um, in order to do the criterion function, likelihood function, we need to be able to work with expected densities. And this is a tricky part which may be uh, hard to some of you. Um, I'm going to break that into a separate video and then you can watch the second part here.